Hi, everyone. Welcome to this uh, session of the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association Conference 2021, a virtual session that we're recording from all kinds of different places, um, which uh, we'll, we'll discover in a few moments. This session is specifically dedicated to um, conversations related to this phenomenon of uh, what some of us call race shifting, self-indigenization, essentially a situation where non-Indigenous peoples in different parts of the world are increasingly claiming to be Indigenous in a literal sense, no longer a figurative or metaphorical sense, but are claiming identities uh, um, that belong to Indigenous peoples and um, are, are doing that for a number of different reasons, depending on the particular national context that they may find themselves in. And so we're bringing people together from uh, very different um, places in the world with uh, different experiences. Some of us are academics like myself. I'm Daryl LaRue. I'm a professor at St. Mary's University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Um, and some of us in the panel are um, also community activists or um, people who work in Indigenous communities. Uh, so we're going to be discussing this from these different perspectives. In particular, we have uh, people like myself who write, uh, write and, and research um, this sort of phenomenon, this race shifting phenomenon in Eastern Canada among French descendants. We have uh, two scholars who study this phenomenon in Finland, so in particular how Finnish people have been turning to a Sami identity uh, more recently. We have uh, some researchers who study the situation in the US South, um, different situations, one around Cherokee self-identification and another around the Chicano movement and the use of indigenous identities and our symbolism in it. Uh, we also have um, a researcher who researches um, self-identification at universities in Canada and the United States. Um, and we have a longtime activist from Newfoundland who uh, a Mi'kmaq um, man who has been um, involved in the sort of recognition process of the Halapu First Nation there who has some stories to share with us. And finally, um, we have someone who works at a university who's uh, really been um, struggling with the uh, questions of self-identification and how to make sense of that as, um, as a Haudenosaunee woman. So uh, without further ado, uh, we're going to we're going to go on with the with the panel. Each person will have a, a, a five minute sort of slot to talk a little bit about themselves, introduce themselves, and um, more specifically, get into their own research. Uh, so we're going to start with uh, Circe Sturm, who I'm very excited um, has um, agreed to join us today. So Circe, it's it's your turn. Hi everyone. Um, thank you for. Uh... But having the idea to put together this session uh, for all of us to talk about this uh, really important topic. Um, I am a professor of anthropology and Native American studies at the University of Texas at Austin. I've also been always in both fields. Um, my first position was at the University of Oklahoma where I was for about 13 years before this one. Um, so I'm gonna jump right into the research because our time is so short. I came to this topic of race shifting, um, a term that I use because I think race is a really important part of the phenomenon, at least in the context where I'm studying it. And what I mean by that is the way in which indigeneity is understood uh, relative to whiteness and how that allows or doesn't allow this process to happen. So I came to this um, in part because research I had done with the Cherokee Nation um, starting in 1993. And at that time, the tribal registrar had alerted me to this phenomenon. Um, he had been collecting information on groups he called entities using the Cherokee name. And he had several file drawers worth of, sub of uh, materials on this and he wanted me to make sense of that. So the tribe was basically concerned with you know, groups that were coalescing together to assert a tribal, assert themselves as self-identified Cherokee tribes. And when I looked through those materials um, for the tribe and put together a report for them, I discovered that there were 257 self-identified tribes. 16 of those have actually got, or not, none of them are federally recognized, but 16 of them have state recognition and 31 have initiated or started conversations with the Office of Federal Acknowledgement. In addition to that, right around 2000, when I started doing this research in earnest, there were 
uh, on the U.S. census, half a million people identified themselves as Cherokee, but none of them were federally recognized. So we know the numbers of citizens in the three federally recognized Cherokee tribes. So this number exceeded those, citizen, those numbers of citizens by half a million. So it's a, a large number of people. So we have an individual claim and we also have collective claims that are happening. And so my research was, is really centered uh, in my book called Becoming Indian on trying to understand why. Demographers know that this is happening but, and they know it's not related to birth and death. And what they've said is that these are individuals, the demographers can look at the data and say, these people were previously identifying as white and now are identifying as native. So for me, it's why are people doing that? Why are they making the shift? And so that's interesting in part because it sort of defies our assumptions that people are trying to pass um, in order to access power necessarily because they're passing out of whiteness. So in my work, one of the things I've discovered is because whiteness and indigeneity are being valued in different ways now that has kind of upset the way in which it's upset these sort of assumptions about what would motivate a change like this. And so we see that, that whiteness is being devalued even though people are maintaining white privilege at the same time that it, indigeneity is gaining value for a variety of reasons. And I can point to the, the, the demographics on this show, the biggest shift happened in the US in 1980, between the 1970 and 1980 census. And this is also when you start to see these groups proliferate. So it actually has a little bit of a, a, a longer history than we might expect. It's not a new phenomenon, it's been going on for decades. So um, I'm interested in the different forms of recognition that play into this and it, particularly how things like state recognition are kind of troubling tribal sovereignty. I'm also interested, as I said before, in how race is a vector that even though we assert that indigeneity is about, not about race, how is race that something that is playing into this and is this just heightened in the US, this race aspect or is it you know, also important in other contexts? So I think I'm at five minutes, probably over. <laughs> no, you. you weren't over. Thank you so much. I wasn't that. over? Oh, no. okay. <laughs> I, I'm going to let you know, uh, sorry, when there's a minute left, I'm going to put my... Oh, so I still clock. have time. Yeah, well, you did. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> no, that's great. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, now actually I'm up. Uh, yeah. So like I, I introduced myself, I'm one of the co-organizers of the session with uh, Laura Yunka Aikio who um, is right below me, hey Laura. Yeah, and I can keep the time for you, so. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, so uh, yeah, I've been uh, researching the dynamics of uh, racism and colonialism among French descendants in Canada, a little bit in the United States um, for the past 15 to 20 years. And it's through that research that I came to this um, realization that there was a, a fairly substantial group of white French descendants like myself who are claiming that they're indigenous today. Um, and they're doing that based on a genealogical movement, essentially. The records uh, for um, the past 400 years of French Canadian history are pretty widespread. Uh, genealogical history in particular, they're easy to access online in all kinds of different ways. Um, and what uh, I found out was that the large majority of French descendants, um, there are about 13 to 14 million of us in Canada, there are uh, three to 4 million in the US are related to the same handful essentially of indigenous women, not all of them, but anywhere from one to 10. Um, so the average is to be related to about two of those women. And that's just because there were so few French settlers uh, over a period of about 50 to 60 years from 1610 to about 1660. And I explain this all in quite some depth in my book, Distorted Descent. What I just wanted to present today is, is how those ancestors are used. So in the book, I developed this idea of practices of descent, which is um, the idea I want to bring out is that we do something with our ancestors as part of this movement. So it's not just an innocent process of finding an ancestor, wanting to honor them, et cetera, et cetera. What it is, is that we find out about perhaps indigenous ancestry or we seek it out. Uh, and then we use those ancestors in ways that make sense to our desires in the present. Um, and like uh, Circe was saying, because of this way in which whiteness is devalued by white people, 
especially as uh, this effort to evade responsibility and accountability in forms of racism, uh, historically and in the present, and indigeneity is valued in a particular type of way post sort of 1960s and 70s, you see that increasing number of white people are wanting to um, quote unquote, become indigenous. So the first practice of descent that I talk about is uh, lineal descent. That's the most straightforward. It's relatively um, uncontroversial. Uh, it's where you, you know, this is often when people, why people do genealogy, they'll find a great great grandmother or great great grandfather and basically trace their line as far back as they can in a single line. Um, what I discovered is that when you come to one of these indigenous women in, in the 1600s, all basically born before 1660, um, that the actual identity of that woman matters very little so that someone could discover that they had an Algonquin ancestor like I did uh, or I do uh, born before 1650 and use that woman to become Abenaki in Vermont or to become Métis in a part of Quebec. So the actual identity of that woman is not important. What's important is how, what role she will play in one's desires in the present. The second practice of descent that I um, uh, sort of develop in my book is this practice of aspirational descent. So because about 25%, 30% at most of French descendants don't have any indigenous ancestry, that means that you might do all this research, really want to be indigenous, but not actually find that elusive ancestor or actually pretty common ancestor in your genealogy. So what happens is French women from the 1600s are magically uh, transformed into indigenous women so that someone could now say that they're indigenous. So that's the second practice of aspirational descent. And the last is what I call the practice of lateral descent. And so that's where um, someone might you know, see uh, an indigenous person with a last name. Let's take mine, for instance, LaRue. They go back in their genealogy. They find that there are LaRues. They then say that they're indigenous. Doesn't really make sense, but this isn't so much about making sense as it is about um, fulfilling the desires that people have in the present. Um, so those are the three mechanics that I really talk about in my book and that I just want to kind of lay out there. because I think um, we'll have some discussion a little bit later on about, um, you know, things related to genealogy, but also related to some of our, our own research practices. So I think I'm done. And I think yeah. I made it under the cut, just like Circe. Wow, we're doing really good here. Um, the next person um, I wanted to introduce is Bonnie Whitlow. Um, so Bonnie, you're up. I was unprepared for that. I thought I was going last. <laughs> Sego Sego Goego. Hi everyone. Goanago Niungyats. Um, my name is Goanago. Wak Skarlewage. I'm Bear Clan. Ganyanke Haga ni Wagu Hunjodo. Um Danu Oswego ni Dwagenu. So I'm from Six Nations and I'm Mohawk Bear Clan. And for me, I was kind of dragged unwillingly into this whole conversation simply because I was working at our university and the people knew that I was Mohawk and there was somebody who was making claims to be Mohawk um, at a nearby university. And um, so they called me to um, just to verify, but the problem were the kind of absurdity or how outrageous the claims that this person was making. And um, they wanted to know if, because universities are currently um, trying to indigenize and decolonize. Um, they wanted to know if it was going to be problematic if they didn't renew his contract. And so um, uh, at first, the first couple of times I didn't engage and I just said, well, that's not my problem. That's like, it's not up to me. I'm not dealing with that right now. And then the last time I was kind of challenged and they said, why are you being so polite? This is a problem for us over. And we just want to know if um, the claims that he's making are true. And they gave me the list of um, four or five names that he had been dropping and kind of hiding behind and asked me uh, to follow up. And so I didn't do any genealogical research, um, but as soon as I started calling around, I started to get phone calls from people and then everybody wanted to talk about it. And they sent me the genealogy, which had been done by his brother. And it showed that clearly, I think he was, I don't remember, it's like three years ago, but it was, I think it was Swedish and French and English uh, 
descent. And it was his brother saying that they had had this story um, in their family lore and he checked it out and it didn't come through. And then more importantly, from the kind of nationhood perspective was I called the people who are responsible for the Mohawk uh, wolf clan um, because he was claiming to be an internationally, what was it? Uh, internationally recognized um, speaker sanctioned by the Mohawk wolf clan and he was an elder. And so those were the terms that were really problematic for us. And so then I started to call all the people who take care of the names and all of the people who take care of Wolf Clan business and none of them vouched. And they all said that he had been a problem. And then um, I happened to cross paths with um, the uh, chief when I was at the great law recital and he very, um, very bluntly stated that this man was not uh, connected to um, the Wolf Clan whatsoever. So um, I called some friends back and I let them know. And um, then I realized that it was like a bigger problem than just this one instance. And that we've been having pro similar problems in the university and including my university. And so I wanted the entire uh, community, our Haudenosaunee cult scholars in particular, the ones who are um, kind of confronting these same types of problems, but maybe with different faces in their universities, just to have a conversation about how do we uh, work together to um, to stop the practice, and where were we, where were we all going to draw our boundary lines, and what could we agree on, and how were we going to address it? So that was it. And um, like I said, the all of the information came at me with, okay, within like, within like three hours, I found out I verified everything. Um, and then um, I took it down and I presented it to our leadership in council. And they agreed to have a letter written, a cease and desist letter to him individually. Um, and then they wanted to do a pretendians conference um, to bring all of our Haudenosaunee scholars together. And they wanted the creation of a policy or a statement from that about how we were going to address it. That's it, that's my five minutes. Thank you, Bonnie, really appreciate it. Look forward to hearing more about that in the conversation. Um, next, we got Sandy, I'll let Sandy introduce herself. Uh, Ani, my name is Sandy Wimagwas. I am Odawa. I'm from Northern Michigan. I'm a citizen of Little Chimers Bay Bands of Odawa Indians. Uh, I am a PhD student at OEZ at the University of Toronto, and my research is surrounding um, the application process when you're applying to university and how universities are asking students if they're Indigenous. And so part of my project was actually researching and applying to different schools as a first time freshman to find out the exact question that they're asking on applications. Um, part of that is um, researching or like looking at most colleges and universities in Canada and then about 200 different schools in the US. Uh, the US is basically all the same that they're really asking if they're categorizing it as either a racial or ethnic category and asking you to choose one or some schools are allowing you to choose like up to two. Um, the schools in the US that are near really large indigenous populations are the ones that are asking like a couple more questions. One of the other questions could be like, what tribe are you or what nation are you from? Um, some of them get even more specific about lineage and asking who's indigenous and what tribe they're from. Um, in Canada, it's kind of like all over the place there are all kinds of different questions that they're asking. Some are just asking if you're Aboriginal and others are asking if you are and you indicate so, then you'll be signed up to receive announcements for any sort of services that they have for Indigenous students. Um, another way that they're asking is uh, up in the far north, they're asking if you're Indigenous and then the follow-up question is what language do you speak at home? So the questions like that are the ones that really interested me about, so how is it that it is becoming um, 
the schools are asking in different ways. And I felt like the ones that had specific questions about like, so what language do you speak at home? And then all the languages that they list are all indigenous languages. It's not, they're not asking about English or French. That really made me think about how we ourselves as indigenous people kind of categorize ourselves or how we identify one another and how we define indigeneity. And it really made me consider and think about like our own indigenous introductions. So that kind of prompted me into phase two of my research where I'm talking to Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe graduate students about their experiences on universities and if they've ever come across race shifting or knowing about that happening while they were at school. And it's personally happened if they know someone or if they've heard stories and what are those stories and what are those like. Also kind of talking about how that may or may not influence the experience that they have at university. And then uh, finally kind of asking them how um, Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people identify themselves. So how do they define themselves? How do they, what makes someone indigenous to them? And I'm doing that based off of uh, indigenous introductions because in an introduction, like in, for instance, an Anishinaabe one, you're asking someone like what their clan is, where they're from, where they're currently living. You might get into like who their grandparents are, but that's not necessarily always there. So each one of those things is really just a different kind of connection and a different kind of circle. So as I'm looking at now and I'm trying to figure out if there's a way that we could um, use the information that we collect in an introduction on and put it on an application form. So how can we use that kind of information in order to kind of keep the indigenous students and filter out the fake ones, filter out the people who are pretending like they're native when they're not. Um, so kind of like where I'm at right now. And the, one of the things that I've come to learn is that it's very complicated. I thought it was complicated before I started. It's even more complicated now. And th there are a lot of folks who are really concerned about um, the people who get pushed to the fringes. So the people who've been relocated or the people who've been removed from their communities, they wanna make sure that they're definitely included in someone who is pushed out because not necessarily have like an active connection now because of colonialism. So it's a really big, long project, but it's super exciting. Thanks so much for sharing part of it with us. I look forward to hearing more about it. Um, so our next presenter is uh, Laura Yunka Aikyo, my collaborator in putting together the session. Laura, you're up. Yep. Thank you. So uh, I am a Finnish uh, academic. I work at the Arctic University of Norway, and uh, I have been working with this uh, issue of um, which now I could call race shifting. But when I started uh, working with this issue, there was uh, I was not familiar with Cersei's work, so I wasn't uh, using this concept yet. So basically, um, I am been particularly interested in the ways in which academia and academic knowledge production is uh, involved in this phenomenon. And uh, the issue in Finland uh, dates actually back to 1990s when uh, the Sami people were taking actually uh, quite big steps towards uh, better forms of not self-determination, but at least cultural autonomy. So in the 1990s, uh, the Finnish state was uh, actually uh, starting to recognize uh, Sami rights in terms of developing a new legislation, which would grant them cultural autonomy and uh, which would be represented by the Sami parliament. And uh, there was also discussion about developing later on uh, Sami land rights. So the rights would be expanded, but at that point it was narrow. And one of the reasons actually why it was narrow was that there was a lot of local resistance and opposition to these developments because many local Finns felt uh, that uh, the development of Sami rights, especially land rights, would somehow threaten their own rights. So there was uh, opposition to this development, which then later on, <clears throat> around 1995, when these laws passed and the Sami parliament was established, uh, then turned into a new strategy whereby people would start to claim that they were Sami. And basically the key of the argument at that point or since then has been the electoral register of the Sami parliament, because even though it's a kind of register which is not public, you don't receive an identity card with which you could access any particular benefits or anything. It became seen as the formal uh, proof of one's Saminess and as such a ticket to certain rights. And that could become true. And so... <clears throat> 
so, so since then uh, there's been a movement or a conglomeration of different movements which have been in different ways arguing for a need to expand uh, the Sami parliament's electoral register so that more people could access. And uh, <clears throat> this has developed into a, a sustained problem. And one of the main problems has been actually the law because the Sami Parliament Act, which was uh, passed in 1995, uh, included also the legal definition of uh, a Sami person. And that law in itself was had some problems to which I don't have time to go here, but which sort of created a window of opportunity for these kind of new claims which were made to Sami identity based on uh, distanced ancestors or like uh, archival records. So this law kind of uh, supported or created a possibility for such claims. And secondly, the problem is that eventually in Finland, the Sami parliament is not the final body which makes decisions on whether a person is Sami or not, or acceptable to the electoral register. So everybody who is, um, uh, who is not accepted can complain to a supreme administrative court, which is a court made of Finnish uh, 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 lawyers. So basically Finns have a final word on this. So this means that these movements in Finland have actually focused their efforts, not in uh, lobbying the Sami parliament, but in lobbying the state on their behalf. And uh, the movement has become uh, more Am I already over time? No. So the movement, <laughs> the movement has uh, uh, grown quite dramatically uh, over the past decade, and one of the main reasons is uh, that um, uh, there's been a kind of academization of the debate. So in the 2010 uh, 10s, there's been emerging a new research which is actually employing and using sort of post-colonial languages and uh, languages of uh, cultural revitalization and marginalization to back up these new identity claims. And this, I think, has been a very successful strategy because now uh, these struggles really uh, appear for many who do not know about the background as struggles within the Sami society between marginalized Sami and elite Sami who hold the Sami parliament. So this has really, I think, affected the majority society. And also it has affected, uh, in, or it has had a role in affecting the Supreme Administrative Court because since 2011 and later on 2015 uh, elections, uh, the court has actually started to support these movements and forced the Sami parliament to accept people who they consider as Finns into its electoral register. And so it has become a very big political conflict and problem to which I can go back in our discussion. But uh, in Finland, yeah, the movement has actually been able to influence also state policy to a very significant extent. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, next, we're gonna we're gonna continue to consider the Finnish context, and uh, Veli Pekka, if you want to introduce yourself. Hello to all. I'm Veli Pekka Lehtola. Uh, I'm a Sami, North Sami from Inari region in northern Finland, and uh, I'm a professor of uh, Sami cultural studies at the University of Oulu. And uh, uh, I have been, uh, uh, I was a uh, member of, uh, of the Sami movement in 70s and 80s when, when we were uh, struggling for, for the, to improve our situation, the Sami situation in Finland. And we were witnessing these uh, big steps that, uh, wo wo that uh, Laura was uh, talking about, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, development of our rights, especially concerning the Sami Language Act in Finland in the 90s, and then the Sami Parliament Act. And uh, also the, the Sami were even recognized as an indigenous people in Finnish constitution. But after that, uh, it became problematic. Uh, we had uh, started to discuss ind indigenous right to land and water already earlier and to self-government, which is quite different in, in Nordic countries than in US and, and Canada. But uh, I think uh, the ILO convention was a 
trigger to another direction that was uh, quite uh, something else than, than the, the positive uh, development uh, that uh, Laura was uh, uh, telling about earlier. And uh, now the Sami rights were contested in, uh, at local level. And suddenly there were people who had claimed to be Sami and indigenous people. Earlier, these uh, same people had uh, proudly called, called themselves uh, Finns and settlers who occupied Sami reindeer pastor lands and, and uh, also bullied us in boarding school, calling the Sami as filthy laps. And now they claim to be even more Sami than the contemporary Sami and even more indigenous than the indigenous uh, Sami. And uh, I was uh, explaining this as a researcher, I, I was explaining this as a, a question of power that when the Sami were gaining more power in uh, in 90s, uh, the, these rights became contested by the Finns. But as Serge said, uh, that the power is only, not, not the only reason here, because uh, it's also about the, uh, uh, an identity question, I think, in, in Lapland, that there, there are many Finns who have quite uh, distant roots, that uh, these uh, families have lived there even hundreds of years in the same areas. And now they, they cannot understand why, why the Sami are emphasized and not, uh, not their rights as they, they understand it. And uh, also there, there is, uh, uh, I think uh, there is also a third party, outsiders who want to, uh, want to confuse the things, uh, the, the, they resist the Sami rights uh, for other reasons and, and they are that, uh, that way resisting. Uh, these um, Sami rights. Now there is a Truth and Reconciliation Commission starting its work in Finland. But uh, surprise, surprise, uh, there has been kind of mistrust against that uh, uh, by the Sami uh, in the air. Uh, and uh, it's no, no wonder. Well, uh, I, I would say that uh, as a researcher, I'm, uh, I have been uh, interested in this uh, counter Sami uh, discourse study it because uh, it has been it has been a very interesting uh, way of speaking. Uh, uh, it were, it has uh, I, I maybe was a little amused about it some uh, 10, 15 years ago. But then I found uh, that uh, this unfavorable decision, for instance, in 2015, when, when uh, the uh, ILO convention was uh, not ratified, uh, these, these decisions were justified with exactly the same argumentation that I had been sneering at concerning the stories uh, in the social media. So, so it uh, went to the Finnish parliament this same discourse that was uh, developed in the local and regional level. And uh, that, that is uh, interesting. Well, how long do I have? I think that's five minutes. That was a great overview of, of your experience and, and the history. All right. Thank you for that. I, I think it also touches upon a concept that Circe developed in her book, um, Symbolic Inversion, where the sort of New, the new quote unquote indigenous people somehow become more indigenous than actual indigenous people. Um, so next we have uh, Elder Calvin White who was uh, involved with the efforts uh, recognition of the Mi'kmaq in Western Newfoundland uh, for decades. And so um, Calvin, you're up. Can you hear me? Am I on? Good. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you, great. <clears throat> okay, great. Thank you very much for having me. Um, Five minutes, a lot to try to get into five minutes. First of all, I think people should know that in 1949, when Newfoundland joined Confederation, there were no consideration given whatsoever to address the Aboriginal population of Newfoundland and Labrador. It wasn't until after the 69 white paper 
that the, um, the knowledge that the federal government had a constitutional responsibility for Aboriginal people uh, everywhere in Canada, including Newfoundland, after we had become the 10th province. In 1970, there was a movement that was building right across this country and also here in Newfoundland. The Con River people and the Flat Bay people where I live, uh, because we live in isolated communities up until the late 50s, we had a better chance of surviving with our identity than some of the families that had moved into larger centers like maybe Grand Falls, St. John's, Cornerbrook, or whatever the case. Um, so we put together a provincial organization to research and to, uh, and to discover um, where would these families uh, ended up living uh, outside of the two communities I before mentioned, Con River and Flat Bay. I was the uh, person who was delegated to take on that responsibility. And I spent the better part of 30 years um, in different positions with the what was known as the Federation of Newfoundland Indians, but always with the, uh, with the uh, mandate to make sure that we discovered and didn't leave any Aboriginal families unrepresented on the island of Newfoundland. So I traveled quite extensively throughout the island of Newfoundland. The assistance that we got from many professors at Memorial University helped us in defining historical notes that had been kept by visiting people to the island of Newfoundland, which gave us, um, in some cases, some new information, but in most cases, it was information that we already had when we say we, I'm talking about the Con River and the Flat Bay people that had been handed on from generation to generation because that's how our teachings uh, educated us with uh, our identity and, and our culture and, and our lifestyle wasn't written in books. It was handed down from generation to generation. But having the, having the, the university to uh, align with us and many of the professors who, who researched the work, what happened was it give uh, legitimacy to what we had been saying, because we had been saying that we were here, uh, we always been here and we hadn't went anywhere. And of course the, uh, the, the bits and pieces of uh, one and two uh, liners in the uh, log books of some of the visiting fleets uh, of fishermen that visit the island of Newfoundland supported that and substantiated that. So we moved, I'm going to move a little bit fast here because I want to get to the main crux of this. We, we moved to a degree whereby we uh, were pressuring the federal government to assume that constitutional responsibility for Aboriginal people on the island of Newfoundland. For the first 30 years of my work, uh, we had discovered and, uh, and recorded somewhere in the vicinity of probably about 12,000, uh, no, about 1,200 people. There were about 1,200 families that we discovered that, um, that uh, historical documentation supported their identity. And uh, when I visited the communities and talked to various other families in those communities, it was common knowledge that those people were Indian people, but not in majority, in very small minority. Um, there were the largest populations outside of the Con River and the Flat Bay area would have been in areas like Glenwood, Central Newfoundland. And that was most of the people that descended from Con River went there to pursue the logging industry. Once the market fell out of the furs, they turned to the woods work and work for the paper mills in order to still have a connection with the land and to be able to earn a living. Apart from that, any other families we found were a very slim minority. We found I knew of a number of families that lived in the Cornerbrook Bay of Islands area only because we've had a continued contact with those people my entire lifetime. If we went to Cornerbrook, we never went to a boarding house or to a hotel. We stayed with friends or family. Uh, likewise, every summer, uh, the children, uh, the Aboriginal children of Cornerbrook, the majority of them would spend their summers in Flat Bay because that's where their grandparents and their great grandparents was still located. So we had all of this, all of this knowledge. And as I said, we, we had documented and could substantiate uh, with a very strong argument that these people were legitimate, at, at least the 1,200 people. 1200, yeah. We were successful in getting the federal government to sit down and enter into a negotiation after a number of challenges, one being a court challenge that they decided not to pursue. 
Uh, and uh, when that happened, what happened was there was a criteria that was agreed to by the Federation of Newfoundland Indians and the federal government with regard to a registration process. And uh, the criteria talked about lineage, but it also talked about a way of life and about historical references to be able to substantiate the eligibility. So Calvin, you got, along, you got two more minutes, Calvin. Okay, somewhere along the line that got lost and a new uh, criteria or, or a more stringent criteria was suggested. And um, from 1,200 people that could very easily be documented with the possibility of offspring from those, uh, the not the criteria, but the application process um, exploded to 90,000 people. We never, ever in the day of our life, and there's many of our elders and people that are still around today, never believe that there are 90,000 Aboriginal people on the island of Newfoundland. There could be 90,000 people that could go back 10, 12, 15 generations and find some lineage somewhere way back, as you spoke earlier, uh, Daryl, about uh, before the 1610. But with regard to having uh, a continued identity and continued marriages into Aboriginal lineages, the numbers are very, very much smaller than that. Uh, I wouldn't take a guess on how many, but we know that they're small, much smaller than that. But the thing about it is that the application process has exploded. The federal government um, accepted 25,000 of those people and then got a little bit scared that the numbers were really, really too high. And in their scare, what they did was instead of legitimizing the numbers that they had already approved, they uh, brought into force what was known as a supplementary agreement to the initial agreement. And this supplementary agreement was had nothing to do with, uh, with historical documentation. Uh, it was... Uh, more on uh, a continued contact uh, with people in your community. And they had this old point system that I could just discuss with you sometime that had nothing to do with genealogy or nothing to do with uh, being Aboriginal. It was more about uh, where you live and how long you live. One other thing before my time runs out, which is short now, is that historically we're aware of seven Aboriginal communities on the island of Newfoundland in, in, in prior, to, uh, prior to, the, to Confederation, much before that. In the movement uh, of the Federation of Newfoundland Indians and the federal government, they designated, I think was somewhere like 67 communities on the island of Newfoundland of Aboriginal communities. No way whatsoever. There may be 67 communities that would have an Aboriginal family living into them, but there are definitely not 67 Aboriginal communities and there's no documentation that we could ever find uh, that would substantiate that. Uh, so race shifting happened around 2000 when people found out that there was a process being undertaken whereby people could register. And um, I, I, I'm not sure if it was done because of the perceived benefit or if it was a phenomenon that was taking place, but uh, it was definitely race shifting. Thank you so much, Calvin. I, I, that's an interesting example of how the state sort of like in Finland got involved and sort of started to legitimize people that really ha they had no business legitimizing. So thank you for that. Um, so our, our last uh, presenter is Ricardo and uh, I'll let Ricardo um, introduce himself. Yes, uh, my name is Ricardo Sainz. I'm a member of the Comanche Nation. I have an Indigenous law degree from OU. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, well, my, my topic is about Chicanismo, and I talk about um, race shifting within Chicanismo. Um, I, I grew up in California, so like there's Chicanismo everywhere. But my concern was the rhetoric that was coming out of the Chicani, uh, Chicano academia, right? And it was a lot of race shifting within it. Um, so like, for example, the work of Gloria Anzadua, and I think um, it was just like, uh, they they promote right, they, just the academia itself promotes race shifting within within Chicanismo. I think um, you know I tried to find the 
what is Chicanismo to these people? Within uh, grassroots, within academia, what is it, right? And I got three different things. It was one, it was an experience. Two was a political theory, and three was an ethnicity. What ex an experience can give you indigeneity, right? Like anybody can migrate to this country and uh, be children of parents that were, you know, anything, not just indigenous, anything, you know, like Chinese or from India or from, any, from anywhere. Um, I actually had a Chicano professor say that even Chinese people could be considered um, uh, in Chicano, right? So, you know, like just because someone's Chicano does not mean you're indigenous. To a political theory, a political theory cannot make you <laughs> indigenous, right? Uh, and then third one's ethnicity. But even within Chicanismo themselves, like they can't, they have arguments about who could be considered Chicanismo, like a Chinese person. Some people say just Mexicans. Some people say uh, Mexicans and um Central Americans, or even people from South America. So, like you know, like there's a there's a, a argument within the the, uh, the uh, you know Chicanismo to see who is Chicano. So for, for for these academics to push like you know like all Chicanos are indigenous is problematic, right? And they use the same tactic as I think you know their points out with the um, lineal, aspirational, and lateral methods. Of, of claiming indigeneity. They try to, they use like ancestor DNA tests. They use uh, just ignorance, their ignorance of indigenous people, you know, like, uh, you know, they'll, 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 they'll claim, um, oh, I had a story like, like a like an oral history that my great grandma was indigenous, but they, they don't know who this grandma is, you know? And eventually, you know, with these DNA tests and, you know, all these oral stories, they'll do the same. I don't know who, who mentioned this earlier, but they'll start claiming, oh, well, I'm brown. I'm more brown than you. I'm, I'm more indigenous than you, right? And, I, you know, it, it's wild that they, they will push these this rhetoric based on phenotypes on what is, um, who is indigenous or not. And it's hard because uh, I think, uh, we, you know, as, as academics, we always want to challenge each other. And within academia, I, I noticed that people that promote these type of ideas, these race shifting ideas, they become very violent or hostile, right? And because I guess they don't like to get challenged. And I think, you know, Chicanismo is an academic machine within just universities. The moment you start challenging their, their power structures, you know, and their, and their thought process, they, they become hostile. And I had some, you know, Chicano professors tell me they agree with me that you know there is race shifting within Chicanismo, but they don't speak out about it because they don't want to get secluded, right? Or they, they don't want to you know get uh, pointed out by by the rest of the Chicano professors. And I think that's really discouraging, discouraging for for as Indigenous people. You know, we have other Chicano professors that that will say you know ask the nine comments like, oh, uh, Indigenous studies should be absorbed into Chicano studies. <laughs> to me, it's like what you know this is very colonial thought, you know, we have our own studies, but they want us to be part of them. And we, even though they're not, in, you know, some, you know, they're not indigenous. Some Chicanos might be indigenous, but not, not as a group as a whole, right? I think, you know, with the, a way to kind of like um, get past this is through conversation. I've been doing this for over 15 years, you know, and yeah, <laughs> my time's almost up. But oh, for, for almost 15 years, I think that the best way to, to have to beat this the race shifting or to, to all these problems to, is through conversation, right? And to to tell people we're not here to attack you, we're here to show you why this is a problem within our communities, not just in the U.S. but also in Mexico, right? All right, thank you. Yes, um, thank you very much for everybody. Um, I think um, <clears throat> it's extremely interesting and also empowering it has been empowering for me personally to uh, realize how much of this kind of phenomena is taking place in different places in the world because in uh, in finland uh, the sami definitely were feeling very lonely with this problem and now that we've been going through these uh, different presentations i would like to open the floor for discussion with the first kind of uh, focus question that we have which is uh, how does race shifting affect indigenous peoples and communities and uh, indigenous self-determination? So we have this phenomenon, but why should we care? What's, what's the problem? Why, what kind of um, 
uh, impact or effect, effect this has on indigenous people. So I was wondering, would Cersei like to start with this question? Yeah, sure, I'm happy to. Um, I think it has numerous impacts. There are legal and political impacts, but there are also are deeply effective emotional impacts. And so there are ways in which, in this case with the Cherokee Nation, there's a, a kind of, uh, you see a, a public sort of, uh, even in Indian country, uh, attitude that Cherokees are uh, very assimilated or largely whites, or that if people are uh, claiming Cherokeeness, that it's, you know, that it's somehow become a uh, reason to question it. And I understand the question, but for people who are Cherokee citizens, it becomes something that's really like, who are these, all these others that are kind of, uh, you know, weighing in on us and claiming our name and how can, it's so, it's such a vast phenomenon. It's really um, very distorting of what the actual Cherokee experience is. Even in Oklahoma, you have, you know, Indian people who are from different tribes who are like, have these kind of assumptions about Cherokees that I think are a distortion because of this event that um, this process that's happening. The other thing I think is, and I write about this in my book, is that state recognition happening is something that in the U.S. context is really, really threatening to the sovereign relationship that comes out of the federal recognition process in the United States. Because in the U.S., that, that is a sovereign to sovereign relationship that has always been, had more weight than state powers within our system of federalism. So suddenly for states to get involved in the process, it kind of muddies the water of who is indigenous. And so if you look at say tri uh, states in the Southeast that have federally recognized tribes and state recognized tribes, which are kind of recognized through all kinds of varied processes, um, some of which are just purely politics and uh, in terms of like, can you get a proclamation done through the state, you know, state legislature. So, so states then have to determine who gets access to funding, who gets resources, who, you know, people locally have to decide who they're going to invite to speak at, you know, the Lions Club or what have you. And so it really muddies the water in many respects in terms of tribal sovereignty. So I think there, there are vast impacts from this. Thank you, Cersei. Uh, Ricardo would like to say also something. Yeah, I agree with Cersei very much. It, very, it muddies the water. I always talk about, you know, the dangers of our sovereignty being infringed, you know, and people, you know, especially like within the Chicano realm, they, they tell me, well, I'm not claiming Lakota, I'm not claiming Comanche, what's the problem? But you're still claiming tribes that are from Mexico that, you know, they should speak for themselves, right? These communities should speak for themselves. They should have their own sovereignty. You know, to infringe on their rights is a problem. And I'll give an example. There was a, a art exhibit, in, at, I forgot, some UC in, in California, some university, and they, the Chicano uh, uh, department, they put an art exhibit that had like a bunch of native stuff and the local native people came and they were disgusted by it. There was a sweat lodge, there were feathers everywhere, you know, sacred stuff. And when the native people said, what is this? The Chicano department said, hey, we are detribalized. But if, you know, like, but if you don't know what tribe you're from, you know, and you throw stuff together, that's not tribal, right? That's not, that's not, mm -hmm. that's not culture. It's just make, it's making things up. And to me, it shows, it just like Cersei said, it mud muddies things. So people, some people that are not native might think that's, that's real, but as, as Native people, we know that's not real. And it's like, you know, it's just gross to, to see that, you know, to see our sacred objects as as art, you know, displayed. But I think we need to have, these, like, I said, like I said, have these conversations and, and, and explain why these, these things are wrong. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Veli Pekka was next. Yes, I also agree with the uh, with you both, uh, this uh, mudding water, or I have always thought that the confusion is an aim for them, that uh, they are aiming for confusing the things. And uh, they have, in Finland, they have succeeded very well. That, uh, for, for instance, the, the media has been confused uh, because they were quite uh, Sami positive in the 90s. 
but uh, nowadays there is much uh, critic about the Sami. And uh, for instance, the idea of democracy seem, seems to turn against the Sami. That how can you deny somebody's compassion to feel something? Yeah. Uh, and uh, how, why are you so, so uh, that you want to have some, some model that everyone has to Uh, that uh, the, um, where's the freedom, and then also it uh, it uh, the confusion is also among the Sami that, uh, uh, for instance, they um, they have as when I, I was talking about uh, that taking over, they have also take took uh, taken over one Sami group. It's called Inari Sami. That. Other Sami groups have quite, uh, they have distinct uh, features that can be very well recognized. But Inari Sami have always been kind of uh, people that have smelled it, uh, different influences there. And now they, they are using this group uh, in, their, in their purposes. Because in Finland, as uh, Laura said, that uh, there can, cannot be ethnic rate registers and uh, you don't know who are the uh, members in the Sami parliament is uh, the, who are voting in Sami some uh, for Sami parliament and uh, because of that uh, the, those uh, these uh, neolabs can use this uh, situation for their own purposes that that uh, mud the water really can, yes. can I Can I add to this, that this really, as you have also, Velipekka, written in your book, like um, um, the fact that the question that who is Sami is now considered by large part of the majority society and the politicians so confusing. So this idea that it's too confusing has been used precisely to not go forward with development of Sami rights in like concrete situations in parliamentary discussions because uh, people feel we cannot go forward because it's so unclear who is Sami and to whom this should be applied. So irrespective of what might be motivations of individual persons, because I do believe that there are also lots of individuals who genuinely feel that this is an identity question who might not be interested in uh, land rights as such, but who have been affected by this whole discourse that has been going on for, yeah, since 1990s. So, um, <clears throat> so uh, irrespective of the individual motivations uh, and that not, not everybody's against Sami rights necessarily, in practice, this movement has managed to slow down and roll back rights, Sami rights in Finland. Um, Bonnie would like to say also something. <clears throat> yeah, so um, this question for us is actually a little bit easier. Um, and the, the way to address it also seems to be a little bit easier because for the Haudenosaunee, um, really the only uncontested um, identity marker that that nobody would ever disagree with is that matrilineal clan. You are who your mother is all the way back. And so um, talking about identity itself just becomes this really kind of chaotic and emotional uh, tense conversation. And in our communities, one of the things that I'm helping with right now is helping with names. So we have these really, um, we have these protocols about giving names and who gets named by who, et cetera, et cetera. And so because of the interference of both the American and the Canadian state, we have people coming to us and showing us these cards and saying, I am such and such a person. And we say, no, you're not. Um, unfortunately, you're not who you think you are. Sometimes they are within the uh, Confederacy membership rules. They're just not, they're often be something like Kiowa Wolf and they're coming to um, a Mohawk bear to get their, 
their names and figure out where they sit in ceremony and which door they go into and, you know, who their uh, chief and clan mother and faith keepers are. All of those things are based on a clan. So I agree that absolutely it is intentional. It is intentional by the state to create that confusion. But fortunately, we have a really easy way of doing that. And that's because we have these epic genealogy societies. They're, they're just, um, my hats are off to them because they can find out who you are in a, in a day. Most oftentimes, not even a day. And they have websites up there and there's conversations that are happening. And a lot of people who are trying to reconnect can come back in. Um, tell them who their mother is or who their grandmother is. And immediately they have five people saying, you know, you're in my family. This is, uh, this is your cousin. Here's some pictures of the woman that you just mentioned. And they can, they can reconnect you immediately. So uh, it makes it a lot easier for us to kind of fight against the, the pretendian mm. because we know who we are. And we have always asserted that only we have the jurisdiction and the right to say who is a member of the Mohawk Nation and of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, nobody else. So when people show me status cards, that is meaningless to us because those status cards are based on uh, patriarchal pr processes and patrilineality, right? It has nothing to do with the way that we define ourselves. So um, it brings up the idea of spectrum of identity as well, because clearly somebody who has been raised on the res their whole entire life is recognized by the entire community as a member of the community. Um, and then there's, there's like, uh, there's kind of like levels, right? So there's the urbanized or the people who have been disp dispossessed and displaced and have gone elsewhere. Oftentimes, we still know who they are. I have lots of cousins over in Buffalo. I have cousins out in BC, and we still recognize them, even though they might not have grown up. Their parents grew up on the reserve. They might not have grown up on the reserve, but they come home for family meetings. They know exactly who they are. They still know who their clan membership is. And then it becomes murkier as it gets further away. So people who have never come in, um, who have never reconnected um, and have been gone for so long that like generations of family have not ever participated in mm -hmm. anything and in any way in the community, then it becomes like more hard or more difficult to, um, to help them reconnect. Mm -hmm. However, there is an authentic way to do so, right? And, and we know what those are, but more importantly, and I think we don't talk about this enough, is we see very clearly all of those inauthentic identity markers, like immediately, like as soon as you have a conversation, flags start going up in your head and you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, we have to like back up here and let me, let me follow up with um, the connections that you just made. So for us, it's just a little bit, uh, easier to do that at this point. And I think we still have to talk about um, um, not just the, the, I think it's actually more important, the community recognition part of it. Um, I don't know, I don't know how else to, yeah. can you hold on a second, my son has just come back in, hold on, hold on. Uh, well, Belly Becker had some comment, I think, to Bonnie. So, um, yeah, since we don't have much time. You can say it now. Yes, thank you, Bonnie, for this um, because it, it's the same among the Sami that we know who who is Sami, but uh, it's a little different in Finland because, uh, as as I said, that uh, we have we don't have this kind of self determination that. Uh, the uh, Native Americans are having, but uh, we are very dependent on the state. And, uh, and uh, the funding of Sami parliament, for instance, comes from the state. And, uh, and as Laura said, uh, the, the membership of the Sami parliament is decided by the, the court, the Finnish court. Those, so the Finns are deciding who is Sami or, or not uh, in order to have the Sami parliament working. 
And now there are more and more Finnish people coming, those uh, so-called uh, laps or, or so-called Sami, coming to Sami parliament and uh, they are taking it over. So, so uh, soon there is a situation that uh, the Sami parliament who should uh, represent the Sami people Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, having the majority of uh, of outsiders. So, so we we also uh, it's uh, our habit also that uh, it's uh, uh, the Sami are saying that kal Sami touta Sami 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 knows Sami, but uh, but in the political reality in Finland, it's a different situation. Yeah. Very good. Uh, Cersei had a um, comment, and maybe after that, Daryl? There, there are a couple of things I want to say. One was that I think the state is always mucking around and um, making this more problematic. And even though the way in which it does so is pretty different in different contexts, whether it's status cards or you know deciding who's Sami in the Finnish case, etc. cetera. Um, with the Cherokee case, you have the state producing roles of membership. And there are lots of different roles that have been made. And some of those roles are considered to be really problematic because there were lots of claimants on those roles. For instance, like the guy in Miller roles are seen to be full of non-Cherokees and very, very problematic. Um, And so sometimes people use claims from other roles, but what happens is similar to what Bonnie is talking about is a nation whether they either have a, a protocol and they know who they are, and as Bonnie's talking about in terms of matrilineal clan and the way in which that's kept and understood, or they make a decision to sort of establish their own their own standards, which sometimes happens through citizenship processes. So in the case of the Cherokee Nation, even though people have different ways of reckoning one another within community, also including by matrilineal clan in some contexts, ceremonial contexts, there is a a role that was decided to be the base role by which citizenship was determined. And so it's really a matter to me of getting people to understand that who gets to determine who is native are are the peoples themselves. And that when there are institutions and others out there trying to, you know, determine admissions, you know, determine whatever hiring, you know, whatever it is, They need to be looking to what is are the standards of nations themselves. And I think there's got to be some way to sort of um, talk about uh, community recognition in uh, as a as a kind of formal standard for um, determining who is indigenous or not. The la- other thing I wanted to say, going to just to dovetail with something that Daryl mentioned earlier, he talked about. Um, how there were cases of ancestors being uh, Alg- actually Algonquin women that get turned into Abenaki or other tribes. And I had the same thing going on um, with the Cherokee stuff where there were people, and it wouldn't be that far back, it wouldn't even be 1600s, but it would be people who we could think of as detribalized who would say, oh, I know I'm Cherokee, I'm definitely Cherokee, I have this word list from my great grandfather. So it's a word list of native words that his great grandfather wrote down. And it turns out that, you know, he's he's asserting a Cherokee identity as a result of this word list and the native identity as a result of this great grandfather who spoke and everything. But even in that short a period of time, it turns out it's a perfectly great Muscogee Creek word list, but it's not a Cherokee word list. So it's like Cherokee comes to stand in for Southeastern Indian ancestry and then gets interpreted, you know, it, it distorts what is the actual truth so that people can't reconnect or know who they are in some ways. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. That's a really, it's a really fascinating point, Circe. Uh, I just wanted to pick up on um, a couple of things that, that I, I've noticed in the conversation. So uh, Veli Pekka, Bonnie and, and Calvin in quite different contexts are really articulating the specific ways in which kinship relations work the sort of responsibilities and obligations that go with those kinship relations and how they last over time um, in, in very different contexts, the Mi'kmaq in Western Newfoundland, the Sami in Northern Finland, um, you know, the, the Haudenosaunee on the Canadian US border. Uh, and to me, that's something that um, when, when I talk about race shifting, 
I'm talking about something that white people are doing because they see indigeneity as centrally about race, which is a problem, right? It takes away the political agency of uh, whether we call them tribes, whether we call them First Nations, whether we, we you know, call them indigenous peoples, that takes away that sort of political um, reality that these, we're talking about political entities that have relationships with states. We're not talking about races of people, but in the white imagination, indigenous peoples, at least here in Canada and the United States are fundamentally about race. Um, and so that's why I was attracted to this concept of race shifting, but we could see being articulated a counter to that that being indigenous is very much about those citizenship processes and or, and or kinship relations and, and how that really becomes central to building um, you know, indigenous self-determination. And, uh, and I'm just trying to flag that as something that's coming out in this conversation. I think uh, someone else had a comment. Uh, yeah, Calvin, would you like to say something about this? how this whole uh, race shifting phenomena affects your community? Uh, yes, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, uh, very, very seriously, because what has happened is that many of our people, because of the government's fear of numbers, and uh, I spoke earlier about the supplementary agreement that had been brought in place, what happened was is that the government decided, the federal government that is, decided to take away uh, status from a number of people. The people who were affected most were the people who were the most legitimate people. And that being because they went through a process of appeals and all of these things that you had to supply, because, because our people are not paper uh, savvy, the, yeah. the elite in society who know how to work the systems and who are best connected with people within the systems, they, their applications and their appeals came to the top. And the most of our people, most of the people, the 10,000 people that had been taken out of the system, most of them were the legitimate people who should have been priorized in the, in the system. So that was one big issue. The second issue that I'd like to address is a simple reason that what we've become we've become a minority in our own government because that was the intent of organizing a structure is to have a government of the people that would speak for the people, Aboriginal Indian self-government. Mm -hmm. What's happening now is that because there's so much race shifting, again, the, the people who want to come in, I should say, first of all, that Mi'kmaq culture is a philosophy. That's what it is. It, it's, it's, uh, conservation, uh, land protectors, water protectors. These are all of the things that is ingrained into you and that you're raised in understanding and practicing. What's happening now or what we see happening and it's only going to get worse is that big developers who want to come in and exploit, they don't have to talk to the Aboriginal people anymore. They talk to the race shifters who are in doctrine in colonialism. And therefore, we've lost our power. So we've taken a step back when we had envisioned ourselves being able to move ahead. Thank you, Calvin. That so much rings bell with uh, where Finland is and where it might be going. And I also wanted to comment on the fact of uh, the race shifters being very organized and paper savvy because for example, in Finland, uh, one of the organizations that has been very active, they, on their website, they provide help and information how to file a complaint to the Supreme Administrative Court and even what kind of things you should put there. So there's encouragement to tell stories about how you connect, how you self-identify, what kind of things you do that are kind of Sami. So uh, there's been very organized ways of pushing people to do this paperwork to get through. Um, uh, Sandy has had problems. Are you online? Uh, yes, I think. Okay. It looks, for me, it looks like I'm in the room. So okay. I'm in the room really than I am. Yeah. Uh, one of the comments that I was gonna make is that um, I think of this as like another tool of like settler colonialism in the sense of like, they pushed us away to residential schools to kind of erase the indigeneity within us. And then now they're erasing it like again in like a different type of way by taking it over, right? By them redefining what it is to be indigenous and them defining 
who is in the category did we lose sandy's voice like i think is that it's just like another tool of settler colonialism okay i'm not sure if others heard everything unfortunately i lost some of your voice but um so i think we have been through the first question and uh daryl how much do we have time i have no idea when we are supposed to finish we have uh well, we have about 15 minutes okay yeah so knowing that we have 15 minutes let's try to keep ourselves very short so that everyone has a chance to tell their experiences so uh, the second question we had is how to challenge race shifting or how to address this problem. So what are the different ways in which we can deal with this issue, which no doubt is complex and in many ways very challenging to respond to. So who would like to go first? Uh, yeah, Bonnie would like to. <clears throat> Yeah, so I wanted to talk about what actually happens when you do challenge, because I think that's uh, where my current problem is, because when I returned to my university and um, um, I started to do some work and I encountered an individual who was making a claim that I found very questionable, I immediately, well, not immediately, because there was this change in leadership and stuff. And I was trying to figure out who was going to be the person that that person would be reporting to so that I went through the proper channels. Um, and so I started to raise uh, an issue with how I, I saw this claim playing out. And I said that I thought it was inauthentic, and that we needed to do something about it. And my university's response was to ask me to not talk about it. Could I just not talk about it? And I refused. I was like, this is an, uh, one of those instances where I am Ganyankehaga first, and I am an employee of the university second. And I refuse to, um, to not stand the line in protest there. And so I said, I didn't think I could do it and that I actually had to talk about it to uh, people in our community. And I did, and I was accused of being acrimonious. And I just thought like, um, no, I'm standing a line and I'm not allowing you to push me around and make me fall into this self ID uh, murky waters that you want to push on me. And so I went back to my, my community again and I said, I'm being asked to not talk about it, which means I actually have to talk about it. And so um, um, there's that. And then the original um, um, case that I got involved in started um, making threats. And there was a whole bunch of um, stuff that was written online about how I was, I don't know, how I was the person who was like, I was, um, I forget what it was, the identity police. And I said, how did I become the cultural identity police? You know, I simply um, presented the information that I was given. And that isn't a role that I want to take on anyway. In a sense, I have to do it as a part of like the community work that I'm involved in. But really, it's about just correcting things and, and kind of closing the gaps. And those gaps are caused by the state, but they're also caused by the self-ID process because they're the ones that are making the waters murky. And I understand a lot of people come back to university and that's their first introduction to a lot of um, the reconnection work that they're going to do in order to, do, um, in order to get back into the community. But it's not about that at all. What it is, is it's about how the self-ID processes in the universities scare the universities because they don't know what to do and then it it becomes this um I don't know it's just all tension and and scary and then I get uh not I get like uh villainized in the whole thing yeah. as if I am acrimonious and that I'm doing something vengeful and what I'm yeah. doing is I'm creating a line a boundary and I'm saying no no, mm. I'm not going to allow that conversation to continue. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of threats and there's a lot of uh, yeah. personal and individual risk in just even talking about it. Absolutely true. Uh, Ricardo would like to say something. 
Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, Bonnie, the, the experiences Bonnie have gone through, I have gone through as well. And, you know, you, just one word that they call us is the gatekeeper, right? Like, oh, you're a gatekeeper. You're being a gatekeeper. But, and, you know, like for a while I thought about it. It was like, what does that mean? But, you know, um, but I think native people, we are gatekeepers to our own sovereignty. So we get to decide <laughs> who's native and who's not, right? So I think the, the, the one important thing to do is to is to have these conversations out in public and not be silenced by people, not by universities, by anybody else. You know, we ha- we have to continue these conversations um, because if we don't, these these you know these people that are not natives and pretend Indians are going to start making policies. They're going to start making you know things that affect our lives. We can't have that. We can't have that at all. So I think we need to we need to become gatekeepers. You know, yeah. we need. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, um, if I can just speak right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to point out that what Calvin described, I think, is an, a, an unbelievable in a way, but believable because of the conversation we're having, example of what's at stake. So we have a situation here where you have Mi'kmaq people for decades um, you know, lobbying the government, working politically to be recognized. And when that happens, the federal government floods this new First Nation with non Mi'kmaq, non Indigenous people. And so that the actual Mi'kmaq people who are part of that First Nation now don't have a voice. Yeah. That's terrifying in terms of sort of the way this could work out. I see it. There's another process like this happening in Canada, the Algonquins of Ontario that I've spoken about a bit in my book, but um, it's something similar. But what I, what I really wanted to just talk about just briefly, it, just picking up on what Bonnie was saying about the university. Um, there are a couple universities in Canada now that are going beyond self-identification because of the sort of discourse, the discussions that have occurred um, in the past few years. And they're putting in like these multi-step processes. So uh, that, that includes the first step is having a status card, having a card that, uh, that belongs to a Métis provincial affiliate or um, a sort of Inuit identity card. So that's the first step. But then there are multiple steps afterwards um, for people who are disconnected. And so there's opportunities to have interviews, to write an essay, to t- have community members come and support you. So there's multiple steps. But the point, though, is that they go beyond um, self-identification. And one of the things that I just found out a couple of days ago is that universities this year um, are being are being uh, contacted in Ontario by the Ministry of, of Education. They're the ones who fund Ontario universities asking why there are fewer self-identified Indigenous people at Ontario universities. And this is a, a drop that has changed significantly. Um, and so the people I spoke to at universities are at specifically at universities that have developed these types of policies are saying that um, they think it's because of this multi-pronged process that many people who don't have any claim to an Indigenous identity simply are not willing to go on. Hmm. And just to pick up what Bonnie said, absolutely. Having a status card doesn't prove necessarily uh, that you're Indigenous or First Nations. I'm just talking about a step in terms of this process. There are multiple steps. Yeah. So if you had a clan mother speak for you, for instance, then that would you know, be a, a way that you could um, confirm that you're Indigenous or in this case, Mohawk. How about Cersei? What do you suggest? How to address Race shifting. Yeah, it's tricky. I think one of the things that um, I've been thinking about is that it takes quite a bit of effort to to suss out things. And I think it, it's really challenging. I, I, I need to think about this more. I think we need to have more conversations about this. But one of the things that I'm uncomfortable with is people from other tribal nations weighing in about the authenticity of someone from someplace else, right? And so it's really, how do we say in an institutional setting, get in a place where we can know um, how, you know, when somebody makes a claim to a, to a, 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 a peoples, how do we know that they are recognized by those peoples, that they are members 
without having without having some arbitrary set of standards that isn't really about what each individual nation does in their processes. And so that's where it gets really tricky because I'm uncomfortable with people who are say, you know, Lakota saying that somebody who's Mikasuki is not who they are, right? Because, because they can't know how that other nation functions. So um, that's one thing that's been on my mind that I think is really important. Thank you. That works, of course, the other way around as well. So we have maybe in the Sápmi and in Finland, Sweden, and Norway, a problem that, for example, people in Norway do not necessarily know about the issue in Finland. So uh, it works this way as well. Uh, we have very few minutes left. Who would like to comment very shortly? Do we have time even for that? Um, Veli Pekka, <laughs> you haven't replied to this question. Yes, I agree with uh, Ricardo that uh, that uh, we should maybe encourage ourselves uh, as uh, as those gatekeepers. That uh, well, I was telling that I was an active Sami activist in my youth, but now I have become an activist a researcher again. Uh, but uh, then it's uh, all, always balancing bit because I know that every time that I make a statement, I got a rain of uh, mud in the, in the social media. And uh, so I'm, I have been a little careful, but maybe you, you'll have to encourage yourself uh, time and time again. Thank you. <laughs> I think this conversation and the panel or roundtable we have had is very productive to us, encouraging ourselves and others also to speak about this problem, which no doubt is difficult to speak about. And I think every one of us has experiences, personal experiences of getting that shower of mud. <laughs> so I'm particularly happy to have been able to share this uh, conversation with you and those people who might be following this in the actual conference. So yeah. thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. everyone. Thanks for being thank here. <laughs> OK, I'm going to stop the recording.